Hello, I'm Malcolm Harslett. It's summer and holiday season is coming up here in Australia and that spells bushfire season. We're talking in this program to Assistant Chief Officer Rob Sandford from the Country Fire Service about what to do to keep our homes as safe as possible wherever we live. Next on Our Time. Hello and welcome to Our Time. Now, I've said this many times before, but I'm a hills boy here in South Australia. I was brought up in the Adelaide Hills at a tiny little place called Longwood. And from the age of, I think, three, one of the first, one of the first and worst bushfires in my memory went through, didn't take my parents home. 83, the similar thing happened. My dad was also brought up as a bit of a bushy in the hills at Longwood and knew what he had to do to, to preserve the house where there was no uh, mains pressure water, only tank water. Now, what's interesting is so many people that moved into the hills in those days really didn't understand what was needed to do to preserve their home and their lives. So we're talking with Assistant Chief Officer Rob Sanford about bushfire and how to look after yourself basically at home and when to get away, I guess. Welcome, uh, Rob. Thanks, Malcolm. And, yeah, it's great to be here to talk about that. Um, well, the season's coming up. And, I mean, we've seen all this happen overseas in Spain, in, in the US, again in the middle of the year when we've got rain falling and, thank goodness, rain fell this year. Yeah, that's right. It's a global problem, bushfire. It's not just unique to, to South Australia or Australia. It's a global problem. It's, is it, do you think it's, you know, everyone's saying, oh, it's, it's because of global warming. Uh, do you feel that is the cause or is it just... Um, nature in a cycle. Some, someone once said to me um, that bushfires aren't as complex as rocket science, and they're right. They're more complex than rocket science because there's so many different factors that go into bushfires I understand um, right here in Australia but um, worldwide. Mm. And there's so many influences um, that, that um, uh, uh, make up how fires burn. Um, so it's not just the fuel, uh, it's not just the weather, um, it's not just the arrangement of the fuel or the dryness and those types of things. There's a huge number of factors that go into it. So by simply saying, uh, as the experts are saying now about the global warning, warming issue um, around the world, um, that's probably got uh, an, 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 an impact, a contributor mm. um, to what we're seeing with bushfires around the world. And last fire season you know, here in Australia was one of the worst fire seasons we've seen on record. And here in South Australia... It was actually CFS. Was the it was the busiest bushfire season we've had on record. And so many of CFS people are volunteers. They are. We've got. We're fortunate. We've got thirteen and a half thousand fantastic volunteers spread Amazing. across South Australia. Amazing. Um, and, and also and men and women. Oh yes, absolutely, absolutely. And um, um, these days, our percentage of female firefighters uh, is increasing, which is which is fantastic. When I joined the CFS. Um, I hate to say because it might show my age, but back in 1982, I joined oh, the you're CFS only as, a, now. As, a, as a volunteer at Tea Tree Gully, just in the foothills. Well, I was going to ask you that actually. How yeah. did all this begin for you? How were you conscious of this? Uh, yeah, well, um, it's been a bit of a um, um, family trait um, for the Sanford family at Tea Tree Gully. You know, back when I was uh, um, a young bloke, um, a youngster, uh, um, um, before I started going to school, you know, Tea Tree Gully really was. Um, not a suburb of Adelaide, you know, it was, it was country no, it was back country, then. Back in like the, the hills, yeah. Back in the 60s, yeah. and I've given my age away now. Foothills. But, yeah. It was foothills. It was part really, of the foothills, it? that's yeah. it. And so our family um, had, a, had, had an involvement with the emergency fire service, mm. uh, and then when the emergency fire service became the country fire service, uh, so I, several of my brothers um, were involved with the CFS at the time. Um, my dad had been involved with the CFS and my mum was part of the CFS as well. So it was a bit of a family tradition to join. Yeah. Um, but um, I must say, you know, I think the reasons we did because, um, you know, we were there to help the community, help our neighbours, because if we help oh, our neighbours, exactly. then our neighbours would come and help us when we needed help. Exactly. And, that, that and it adds to spirit. the social community atmosphere, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It does. And at this time of the year, you know, it's easy to be on, on, your, on your phone or on your computer at home uh, Googling stuff, but really this communication in all facets of, of I suppose, traumas to mm. people in life. And we've got to realise yeah. that we're so insignificant as humans. Yeah, absolutely. And, 
you know, um, whilst, whilst we're in the bushfire season now, um, our, our, our CFS volunteers are busy all year round because it's not just bushfires that our volunteers deal with. There's road crash um, events mm -hmm. that happen daily around the state that our volunteers respond to. And they, they unfortunately, they use um, hydraulic rescue equipment to cut, mm -hmm. cut people out of cars sure. Is uh, it still after called accidents. the Jaws of Life? Oh, that's a brand name. But, yeah, oh, the okay. Jaws of Life. Everyone knows what the Jaws of Life are. Yeah, so they use that hydraulic rescue equipment. Well, we respond to structure fires, house fires, uh, you know, um, other factory fires and those types of things. We deal with hazardous material spillages, so chemical spills and that type of thing. So our people are busy all year round. We forget that, actually. Oh, absolutely. No, so, I, I wasn't yeah. even aware of that myself. Yeah, so we, we um, you know, the CFS across the state with our people, we, we operate from 430 locations with about 1,000 vehicles in the CFS fleet. So um, we're busy all year round, but then when the bushfire season comes along, and as you said, Malcolm, that communications is a key uh, for us with the community, mm. um, both to find out information about emergencies, mm. but more importantly, so that we can inform the community about when there are emergencies as well. Well, that was the, an, an issue that we discussed when we had the police on talking about the COVID situation, mm. because you, you, you sort of don't think um, how many people are involved trying to deliver this information yeah. out to the people and now of course with so many different methods yeah you know it used to be a newspaper now it's the phone <laughs> now it's the this now it's the that it's really hard to keep up with that is yeah that how is. many yeah when you went to your first fire what what do you do you have a recollection of that oh, time? It, it's a long time ago now but yeah I, I um you know the back then in the early 1980s um our training wasn't as formal as what it is these days um, but we got good training and we've always had good training and our personal protective clothing that we wear. When I started, we were just in uh, cotton overalls, um, but now we're using the most modern of fabrics to protect our firefighters, both from, both from a bushfire perspective, but from structural fire as well. Yes, so I do remember that. They were like, they were khaki sort of over, khaki overalls. Yeah, yeah, yakka overalls. Yakka overalls. Yakka overalls. Yeah, that's all they were. I remember that. Then. So... But you know, and cotton burns. Yeah, and, well, eventually it does. <laughs> if it does. you're in the yeah. yeah. But the training back then, you know, really set us up. Uh, and one of the key things in CFS is the teamwork within our brigades and across the state in the whole of the CFS. So, as a man, mm. and also as a, a family man mm. or with women, mm. do you feel it's it's something that is in our psyche? I mean, we just talked mm. Brett just a minute ago about the community aspect of this, the, yeah. the ability to help each other. Hmm. But do you think we're losing this sort of attitude as a general thing? Uh, no, I don't think we are. Um, you know, we've So there's still plenty of volunteers coming up? Oh, yeah, there are. Being there aware. Are. And, you know, um, this, this calendar year, so since January this year. It's been a good year so far. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we've seen, seen about seven to 800 new members in CFS across the state. Um, so we get about a thousand new people each year, and we lose um, lose a, not a similar number, but we lose a percentage of people as well. People retire or Can't they move away, away, and yeah. uh, and that type of thing. So yeah. our numbers are pretty steady right across the state. Some of our brigades are always looking for members, um, but some of our other brigades um, actually have a waiting list to become a member because. Oh. Um, they're, they're, they've reached their cap of the number of people that they can have. In the so brigade. there is a limit, obviously, in times of crisis. There's a limit to the number of people that can really function with what you've got to function with. I yeah, guess. well, when you think about it, you know, everyone needs training. Yeah. So that, that, that costs money. It, we need to kit everyone out in the latest protective clothing. Mm -hmm. And then their skills, we need to maintain their skills and that type of thing. So, you know, that all comes at a cost. Um, so we've got a formula about how many people each of our brigades across the state need um, and then they're funded for that and we provide with the protective clothing and that type of thing. Right. And um, when we were talking previously about um, you know, having female firefighters, I actually think female firefighters are smarter than male firefighters. Um, in my career in CFS, both as a volunteer and as a staff officer, I've trained a lot of new CFS volunteers. And right. I always see the difference between males and females. When, when you set a task for the new firefighter, um, the normal male macho thing is bullet a gate or go and shift it, move it, knock it down, get it out of the way, yeah. whatever. But uh, when you see the women come through and the training, exactly the same scenario, they actually stop and think and work through what is it that needs to be done. So it's fantastic that we're um, so supportive of female firefighters um, these days in the CFS and, 
and, and I think that's a reflection of the community as yes. well. We're seeing a greater um, involvement um, of uh, of females right across uh, a range of things. When when I first joined the CFS, we didn't have any female firefighters in the Tea Tree Gully Brigade, um, but it was only a couple of years later that we did, and today um, there's I think there's eight. Uh, female firefighters in the involved in the Tea Tree Gully Brigade, so that's fantastic. fantastic. And, and also from a staff perspective, mm. CFS is, a, is whilst we're thirteen and a half thousand people strong across the state, um, we've only got about one hundred and sixty-five staff, one hundred and seventy staff across the state to support those volunteers, and almost half of those are female. So it's uh, you know from an industry perspective, it's great to see that um, you know the, the 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 women are involved yeah, exactly. and interested enough. Um, to either pursue as a volunteer or to pursue as a career as well. Well, I think that's now coming out across the board with men and women generally, the equality that should have been always there. Absolutely. And Absolutely. now that the mindset is there as well, yeah. out, uh, from both sexes, it's yep. a big improvement. Yeah. We're going to be looking at some fire um, situations in a minute. We'll, we'll also talk to Rob about what you can do at home to protect your home, whether you're in the country, in the hills or in the city. Back in a tip. Welcome back to our time. Our special guest is Rob Sanford and we're talking about bushfires, not just only in the bush but wherever fires exist. Uh, Rob, uh, let's have a look at some pictures of mm -hmm. bushfires, recent bushfires in our state because it really it, it reminds us that a bushfire starts with smoke, which is when we see it first of all. Yep. Um, we can see that's, that was taken in 2014 mm. when there were bushfires all over the place. And there are obviously times we should be moving uh, out of the way of bushfires, perhaps leaving our home or whatever. When we see this dark smoke, you sort of know you're in trouble. Here are some of your people. Would they be volunteers or permanent staff? Do you no, think? They, they'd be volunteers. Um, that, that fire appliance there? No. Obviously, the police are involved trying to um, contain traffic and people movement out of the zone. But, I mean, that's in a magnificent picture of nature at work. <laughs> but as little humans wandering around in nature, it would be nice to be out of it all, really. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and bushfires can happen. Uh, anywhere at any time during yeah. the fire danger season. Oh, and and so simple to start. Um, now we're starting to feel the heat of the fire. The the people involved in this really they're taking their lives in their hands, aren't they? They do. the The CFS volunteers do do put themselves in harm's way um, in support of the community. And this, of course, is the the frightening thing that everybody lives in fear of: losing Devast a home. Devastating. Yeah. And really, you know, we're so insignificant when it comes to the power of the fire. Yeah, it, it, fire is a tremendously powerful weapon um, that destroys property in, in a split second. And what it leaves, of course, and here are some photos of really what it leaves, animals in distress and nothing. Uh, it's true that gum trees and a lot of the flora and fauna in Australia needs bushfire to mm. reproduce. But um, the koalas don't. No, no, that's right. Yeah, the the, the Australian bush is um, built for fire, um, but uh, a lot of the um, fauna um, can be devastated, as we've seen recently during last fire danger season. So I guess the reality here is what can we do as people living, first of all, in the bush? What are the things we need to look out for prior to the fire season? I think the first thing to understand is what is the risk to you and your family? So if you're living in a bushfire prone area, you need to understand that risk and, and what that means for you and your property. But it's not just people that live in the bush or in the country areas of, um, of Australia or South Australia. Um, you think yourself, Malcolm, what, what did you do last summer? Did you hop in the car one day and drive up to the hills to have a nice lunch somewhere? Yes, I mean, we do those things. L lots of people do that yep. on a daily basis. Yep. So you need to be aware of um, when you're entering those areas about the dangers or the risks of bushfire and know what you're going to do in that situation. So it's not just True. those people I've that live there. i never thought of it in those terms. Yeah, it's not just those people. Because they don't that, live in that anymore. No, so, and, and we need everyone, the whole community, to be prepared for, for bushfire 
when the fire danger season is on us, as it is at the moment. Well, I do remember years ago a, a promotional, oh, not promotional, well, I suppose it's the right word, uh, of smokers who casually threw butts out their window, yep. for example. Yep. Simple little things, or maybe That's starting a fire yourself to cook a barbie in them. That's it. And there's a range of different reasons why fires start. But if you own a property, then... Um, you have a responsibility not just to yourselves but to your neighbours and your community about being prepared. And we always talk about, you know, making sure you cut the grass and you clean your gutters and, you know, you move the wood pile away from the house during summer that you use during winter um, for the for the slow combustion yes. heater. Yeah. Um, but you also need to prepare the people and that's a key thing these days about preparing yourself, your family, your neighbours uh, and your extended family and friends about what it is that you're doing during the fire danger season and and we want people to take action before a fire starts. Right. Quite quite often we see people wait until there's a fire and then do something and quite often that's too late. So this might sound a silly way to look at it but there are occasions in our lives like birthdays when we're all together, Mm -hmm. Christmas when we're all together. Is it a good thing to actually make a point of bringing that subject up at that time? Absolutely. Absolutely it is. And um, it, it's simple to do. Um, mm. You know, to mm. develop a bushfire survival plan mm. only takes five minutes. And then to share that with your family, share it with your friends, share it with your neighbours. It's, so it's that, a where we're going to go. Is that the? Is that one of the, apart from keeping everything clean around yeah. the house? Well, one of the first questions you need to ask yourself, am I and my family able to defend this property if we're threatened by a fire? Yes. And if the answer yep. is yes then there's a range of activities and a range of things that you need to do in preparing to be able to do that. If the answer's no, I'm I'm not prepared or we're not in a position to defend this property, then that's the trigger to actually leave. And and we always say you should leave well before a fire starts. (laughs) Understandably. Yeah. It was um, a few years ago someone said, I've just got um, a terrific system of sprinklers on the roof Mm -hmm. to save my house. Yeah. And I said to them, so what genera- You know, what makes that work? Oh, they said, well, first of all, we thought, you know, if the power lines are down, the pumps won't work. Mm-hmm. So we put in a petrol generator. Yep. So you don't think the fire might affect that when it gets hot? <laughs> yeah. So the, there's a range of things that people can so, do. Yeah, if, so if, what do you do in a case like if, that? If they're going to protect themselves. So, you know, you can get diesel pumps or you can actually get petrol pump, petrol pad pumps or a generator to, to run those things batteries, and operate Are those. batteries an option? Or uh, they, they can be. You, you, you know, that, the battery technology these days is fantastic and we're seeing that with solar systems and the storage for power with batteries and those mm. types of things. So there's a range of different things. But should things. they be buried or, or should they be out of the way that if fire did come close to a home, yeah. Yeah, so they wouldn't get... So, so that's, that's all part of preparing. So if right. we're going to put in a sprinkler system... What is it that we need to do to do that effectively? Do we need a pump? Do we need a generator? Where are we going to place that so that it's going to be safe? Yes. So that that, that watering system that we've put in is going to be able to protect the property. I guess. And, 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 the, and if people are there, protect those people as yeah, well. Yeah, and away from the house, I would imagine, yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, is there sort of a rule of thumb when to leave? As you said before, before the fire. Yeah. Before the fire hits your house. but. Yeah. Is there a is there is it a sign in the smoke? Is it listening to the radio yeah. or getting something from a website? Yeah. Mm. Earlier on, we spoke how important communication is, and and that is, and we want everyone to be armed with as much information as they can. Mm. So let's say for tomorrow, for example, the fire danger rating for the Mount Lofty Ranges, so that the, the surrounding hills around Adelaide, is going to be severe. So there's a the, the fire danger rating severe, extreme, and catastrophic. And we usually see that on a news service. We do. Yeah. So, getting that information and then saying, are we able to manage looking after ourselves and our property if the fire danger rating severe and a fire starts? Mm-hmm. If the answer is no, then you should leave either that night or the or the following morning on that day um, before any fires start. They're the decisions we, we need to make. Now, we CFS will provide information to people about what the fire danger ratings are, how to prepare their properties, and those things that and they should... And this is a central place? Yeah, so go, go to the CFS website. Exactly. Or go to their local the, council. Well, the CFS website is... 
uh, cfs.sa.gov.au. That's not hard. It's not. That's not. Um, yeah. So that's here in South Australia and Victoria. There's a similar, 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 yep. similar. The the um, rural fire services right across Australia mm-hmm. um, have have all that information available to people. But if tomorrow's going to be a day of catastrophic fire danger, then we're saying even if you are prepared, don't be there. Leave the night before or the morning of and be out of that area. And unfortunately, history has shown us mm. on a day when um, we've got a catastrophic fire danger rating yes. and those conditions are the absolute worst and a fire starts, they move so quickly and they are so destructive. And we saw that right across Australia last year from Queensland um, through right. New South Wales, Victoria, into South Australia on the worst of days. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, um, we want people to make informed decisions so we'll provide them with as much information as we can but we want people to use that information and make really good decisions about their safety you know, it, but it was also a, over a season where you know people were coming together for christmas that's it yeah and, and it's making it, it more difficult really. It, it, it really is it really is and you know we want people to make those good decisions unfortunately or fortunately you know people we want people to be insured so that if they leave and their property is destroyed then they're able to rebuild their lives because they're insured. Yes, well, the point I was going to make is bushfires don't recognise Christmas no, or any no, other public holiday <laughs> yeah. when people might gather. Yeah. And like we said, you know, there's a range of different reasons why fire starts as well. And um, we work very closely with the police here in South Australia, as all the fire agencies right across Australia do, mm-hmm. work very closely with their police because we're interested about why fire starts and how we can minimise those fires starting in the future. So we work hand in glove with the police in regards to that. So they've got a um, a legislative responsibility, um, you know, if there's a deliberate act um, to take action with that. But but the police here in South Australia uh, have a great program running during the fire danger season to support the CFS, but to support the community Mm. and keep the community as safe as we all can, working in cooperation. That's the game. We've got a little, a little bit more time left and we'll be talking with Rob a little more in just a tick. We're talking about the fire season with Rob Stanford. Sanford. Rob, um, we hear a lot about the First Nations understanding of how to work with, live with and control fire and use mm. it to their own advantage. Yeah. How much is that infiltrating your knowledge these days? Oh, it's a huge part of the CFS. I'm, people probably aren't aware. We've actually got um, eight CFS brigades that are um, Indigenous brigades. Right. So in the APY lands in the north of the state, uh, Nepabunna, again, you know, in, up near Arkarula, um, and then mm. uh, down in the, uh, the Coorong areas and those types of places. So we um, um, have um, a great connection with the First Nations people, with the Aboriginal communities, right across the state, and they have fantastic input into um, how to prepare the land and maintain the land as well um, for bushfires and how to manage that type of thing. So, Do you think we were missing out before by not really getting that knowledge? I, I think um, some of that knowledge has been lost, unfortunately, yeah. just through, um, through time. time. Mm. But I think now more and more um, it's great that um, the Indigenous people of Australia are becoming more and more involved and... and passing on that knowledge to everyone to make it better for everyone. And also for the country and the regeneration after the event because we're never going to stop fires. No, that's right. No, we'll, we'll never stop. We we'll just nev- we'll we never need stop to live fires. with them. Ha- how to learn to live better with them. Yes. Um, because we have, um, we've really um, pushed um, the European way of living into the bush in Australia when our Indigenous um um, First Nations people have always known how to manage fire and how to manage the land from a productive perspective yes, so yes, that they can feed exactly. their families and um, but more importantly they can feed their next generations coming along about how they manage the land. We've got to go but there's so much more we can be talking about so great that you could join us I hope you've understood more about what Rob is helping to help the whole country to survive through this bushfire season. We'll see you next time. Keep yourself nice till then.
special guest next time on Our Time is actor, pianist, theatre director, teacher, theatre reviewer, Barry Hill. Barry, we're talking about your life mm. and what's inspired you. What's inspired me is the opportunity to work with people who I could never, ever in any other field get to work with who have changed my life forever. Special thing, show business. It is. Next time on Our Time, we just need you.